Okay, in this video, I want to update you guys on everything baby S and foster care, where I'm at in the process. I think there's some people that don't know exactly where I'm at in this process. I'm going to update you there and I'm also going to tell you about the things that I've learned in these uh, first four months of life, the last two months, two plus months of having baby S in my life. That's what we're talking about today. Stay tuned. So today's not a vlog style, I guess. It's, you're not following us around doing anything. Um, I am just gonna update some people. I think that there's, I don't think, I know that there's people that don't know this whole story. I know people have jumped onto the YouTube page um, later in my uh, journey and uh, I just wanna update some people where we're at. So if you do not know, I am a dad to a four month, next week he will be four months old, um, baby boy who goes by the name of Baby S. He is in the foster care system currently, and um, should he ever be available for adoption, uh, if that happens, I gladly jump on board for that. Where we're at right now, he was placed in my care when he was one month and about a week or two old. At that time, I had never been a parent before. I have taken care of children in the past, but this was something that I was um, obviously knew I was looking forward to, but man, have I learned that there's so much to parenting that you are just, you can never be ready for. You can never be ready for. Um, right now, we had, this week, we had what's called a family meeting. Uh, it is with the entire, it's with the county, the people at Department of Children and Family Services. And um, there were some other people that were involved that monitor Baby S's motor skills and make sure he has any of the resources that he needs for his development along the path of him being in the care of the state. So we had that meeting this week and it went amazing. It was postponed the first time and actually I think it was postponed two times. And then we finally had the meeting. Um, it was a couple people on this Zoom call and they basically go over what are my goals for baby S, what do I want out of this, what are my fears, what are his needs. And I get an opportunity to talk on that um, and the other people like his social worker and the mad assessor get an opportunity to talk on all of that. So it was a really, it was a time where I got to just be extremely vulnerable. People have in the past said, oh, well, you want to make sure you, you know, walk a fine line when you talk about adoption to the county and things like that. And I don't know what it was something weeks ago it was when i met his social worker i just had this feeling of like i'm not going to deny that i want to adopt this boy like that, that i'd be lying and when we had that conversation on the during the family meeting i said like i'd be lying if i said i was i i wouldn't be devastated if he got rehomed you know reunified back to his home and back to you know i'm sorry his biological parents and i said but you know i think that babies need, what he needs right now in his infant stage is bonding and attachment. That's an emotional connection. So if he gets rehomed and I'm not devastated, I'm not heartbroken about it, then I would question if I gave him the needs emotionally that he needed, he needs. But I said also, you know, I fully understand I'm going to be 35 years old in two months. I get it. Like, I can logically and intellectually make sense of reunification and it's real. And I knew what I was walking into when I got into the foster system. So I support that if that's the first step, if that's what we're gonna do first. But if not, I wanna adopt bad. And they know that. And I have never been shamed by the department for that. I've never been shamed by social services for that because they appreciate my love for him and they they're glad I want to if that is what happens um, so we had that meeting um, I, I, I don't want to go I never want to go into his story into the specifics of his story 
of uh, anything about his biological parents. I never want to share uh, what his journey through the system is. I only, this channel, this YouTube channel, my Instagram is only about me navigating the foster care system and being a parent in general. That's it. This is not about his story. And I thank everyone for the, all the support because there's been a lot of people that have been really supportive through this and haven't asked those questions and I appreciate that. When a child is detained in the foster care system, this is across uh, DCFS. I, I don't know if it's just this county or if it's statewide or countrywide, but uh, the, the, the county has to basically declare why they detained a child from a family. Um, and that's the meeting that we're having, the hearing we're gonna be having. I'm, I'm always, I attended the first one uh, where it got postponed. I'm attending this one because I wanna be there to support baby S. I wanna be that parental figure in his life that is always there for him. And I wanna show others that as well. So I don't know how that's gonna go down. I don't, I don't really know the, the ultimate goal of that other than them expressing why they detained him and put him in my care. Um, I did do what's called a JV290 form. As a foster parent, you're not allowed to talk in court, to state anything in court, unless you complete what's called a JV290. And that is a document that the courts here in LA County have put in place for where a foster parent or a caregiver can complete this document and it, it allows you the opportunity to talk about the person, in the child in your care um, and communicate that to the judge. And what you can do is have, you know, uh, you can write a letter that attached to that. So I did write a letter to the judge for this hearing, just stating about, you know, baby S's development and his motor skills. I included pictures because he has never seen him. I want whatever judge is working with baby S to not just, to not see him as only a name, but put a, a face to that name and know that this is a real human being. Um, so I put pictures of him and he and I, and I talked about our every day and what we do and the things that we do in our days. And um, that way it can be expressed to the judge. And, and he'll get that, his attorneys will get that, uh, all the attorneys involved will get that. And at least there's an opportunity for my voice to be heard and an advocate that's as close as I am to baby S to be heard. So that's all happening. We have the family meeting, we have the court date next week. Um, and after that, we basically continue this journey of, you know, me caring for him, being his parent and being his foster parent and, um, you know, we do all the things that are involved, you know, visitations, we do, uh, the, I have a county social worker that meets with me in my home to meet him and see how things are going every month because I work with an FFA, which is an agency that's licensed directly with the county. Um, I have to meet with my agency, my foster agency, once a week, every single week we meet. So all of these things are constantly at play. Sometimes there's new happenings. There's a new development in his case currently that uh, kind of sprung up this week or last week and I heard about it this week. Um, I will say it's a little bit, um, you know, nerve wracking, but it's okay. I know that there's a process to all of this and I have complete faith that everything's gonna transpire the way it's supposed to transpire by God. Um, so that's kind of the update of where things are at. Um, my Instagram, I have been meeting the, the most kind people ever. Um, it, it has been amazing to get the messages that I get from people thanking me for telling them about this journey, for being gay, for being Christian and a single dad and documenting it all and sharing it all with people. Um, I literally get d direct messages thanking me for that and telling me that I'm inspiring other people of color, gay men, Christians um, that want to be parents and have been pushed away by the Christian faith or pushed away by society and feeling that they can do these things. And I just wanted to share my journey to fatherhood. And I don't know what it is about me or that's in me that 
allows me to be vulnerable openly to the world as I do and have been for many years in different ways, but I, I do and I'm comfortable with it. Um, so that's that. So here's, uh, let's transition a little bit. Here's what I've learned in the last two and a half months and you know, this four months of life with this baby boy. He's asleep right now. We got on a pretty good sleep schedule and I will give mad props to the Huckleberry app. That app is wonderful. They don't work with me to sponsor anything. It's a wonderful app. I think as new parents, whether you're single or not, download an app like this because it allows you to track the last time they ate and it keeps a timer so you know if it's been two to three hours. I don't care what anyone says. You may say, oh, I'll remember the last time they ate. No, you won't. There is so much going on in your life, especially as a single parent juggling work and social life and baby. The last thing I can remember is what time he last ate. So every time he eats, boom, I log when he ate. Um, when he sleeps, you click the timer. It times, it does like a stopwatch to t time how long he's been sleeping. And you can notate how he fell asleep, where he fell asleep, all the different details about it. And then you can kind of track his sleep patterns a long time. And it'll also help you, um, it'll alert you when the next best time for them to go down for a nap. And I'm telling you, when I use this app, the naps are easier. I can understand why he's a little more cranky because if I'm like, oh, he's cranky right now, I'll look at the app and I'll see that he's actually projected to sleep for a nap in about 17 minutes. And then I'm now trained to be like, oh, he's just fussing because he's tired and I can rock him to sleep or do what I got to do to put him down for a nap. So I would say to any new parent, get use technology, use the resources that are out there and get something to help you navigate this parenting life with the sleeping and the eating. The other thing that I have learned um, is kind of, re it's related to sleep, it's sleep training. So newborns go through these phases where when they are about two months old, they're getting in the rhythm of sleeping at night, right? They, they start to have some sense of like sleeping and sleeping at night rather, longer than the daytime. So he actually did really well in his early three month, end of two months, beginning of three months, he was doing super well. He was sleeping five hours and then he'd wake up, I'd feed him and then he'd sleep another, I don't know, three to four hours. And that was really great because I was going from no sleep to getting five hours of sleep, which was fantastic. Now there's this wonderful four month sleep regression that is apparently a thing. And it's literally like everything went out the window. And from what I understand and what I've read is it has to do with REM sleep and them being older and understanding um, their emotions and how they feel as a person and being jerked away because babies have these reflexes where they'll jerk and that'll wake them up. And now they can make more sense of that, that, that their, their parents not here, it's dark, it's all these different things. And then they cry and they want you. And it's hard to get them to fall back asleep unless you give them what stimulated them to sleep um, or helped them go to sleep when they went asleep initially. So there's all these advocates that say, do the cry it out method, the Ferber method. Uh, there's all these different ways of don't rock them to sleep, put them in their crib when they're awake, let them fall asleep. There's people who co-sleep. There's people who say co-sleeping is like Satan's, I don't know, recipe to life. I don't understand. But what I will tell you is what works for him is rocking him to sleep. Now, the downside to that is that when he inevitably wakes up because he's going to wake up um, and now it's back to every two to three hours he's waking up, he's freaking out because last thing in his mind was I was rocked to sleep in my dad's arms and now he's not here, I'm in my crib and it's dark. So I then have to go back in, soothe him again and we do this game over and over and over. And I don't know the answer to it. I don't know the answer. I know this. I have to do what I can do to take care of myself and him. And I'm at the point where I don't know if sleep training is best. I think I need to continue with the rocking to sleep. 
I think he wants to be close to me. Another thing is, look, you know, he's in the foster system. He's been removed from his biological parents. I worry about any sort of cry it out method. Is it causing more trauma? Because it is traumatic to remove a parent from their biological parents. I'm, I'm sorry, to remove a child from their biological parents. So am I triggering any sense of, I don't know, past trauma? If I do that, it's hard to not rock him to sleep and give him what he wants just to be close to me. Because sometimes I feel like if I don't do that, or if I do that, I'm enabling behaviors during this four month sleep regression where they say they will, they will, these, whatever you do now will be behaviors that they are learning for the future and years to come. Am I enabling a, a, a attachment? Am I enabling negative, uh, um, like, um, uh, anxiety, separation anxiety? Am I enabling him to not fall asleep when he's one, two, three, four, five years old without me by his side and staying asleep through the night. And then you hear these success stories from other people and they're like, it's doing so great with sleep training and it's working so well. And I just don't know what to do other than give him this, the literal rocking that he needs because there's something in my gut and in my heart and I think it's almost primal, it feels, that's like, there's nothing wrong with that. You can't tell me that there's anything wrong with holding your baby to sleep. I wonder how much of sleep training and, and your child falling asleep and being independent at four months old. He's been in this world for four months. That's it. He was in a belly, warm, cozy, dark, protected for nine months. And I want him to exist independently, even through sleep at four months? Does that make sense? I don't know. I don't think that really makes sense. I think it makes sense to love and nurture him and not do anything else. So that's the update that I have. That's where I'm at right now. That's who we are. I am navigating this and learning day by day by day. But thanks guys for just watching and listening to this. I know it's not the vlog style and I see the analytics. People love the vlogs and watching us go through our day. But I also get these questions from people. Hey, like how old is he? And how did you get him? And da 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 da, what's his story? And I wanted to take a minute to kind of address some of those things um, because you know people wanna know. Um, but that's it. Thanks for watching. I love you guys. Thanks for supporting. Please, please, please like and share these videos. If you guys could help out with just, you know, a comment, a like, it would be, it would mean the world and it would really, really help a lot. And also click the subscribe button. All right. Bye everyone. Peace out. I love you all.